Edward Yang made films about Taiwan, about Taipei. It's sprawling, hyper-connected, hyper-financialized capital. Between 1982 and 2000, and his death, he would make eight films which gravitated around the emotional and social lives of people who live in, who live and work in this contested island metropolis. These people who are in the process of assimilating their own modernization, as Frederick Jameson argued, reflecting on the toll that such a process had on psychic subjects, that's his phrase. Yang himself posed this problem in the beginning of 1994's A Confucian Confusion, starting a dialogue between the philosopher Confucius and his disciples. The city is too crowded, Confucius says. What can we do about it? Disciples rejoined her. Make the people rich. The old sage replies. But what comes after they are made rich? Back in 1997, Jonathan Rosenbaum considered Ming and Chi Chi and Qin, some of Yang's protagonists, to be exiles in modernity. They became rich. But what did they become in the process? There's a risk that these kind of POMO readings can overdetermine how we receive and actually watch Yang in his cinema, and the specific tones and textures of the Taiwan New Wave, of which he was a part. But modernization can't be stepped over in these films. Yang makes the city a subject, and he makes business a subject. Boozy, flirtatious, anodyne, exhausting, romantic. Jameson again, modernism is temporal, postmodernism is spatial. Glassy office blocks, fax machines, mobile phones, concrete car parks, motorways, broadcast of NBA games in late night bars, advertising hoardings and screens. Here is a periphery, a margin that is merged messily, collapsingly with an ascendant and obliterating center. Sure. But Yang is funny and mournful and human and messy. Mm. He has a real realness, which is made even more real by the profusion of places and spaces that blur the global and the local. Jameson was talking about aesthetics, but he was also talking about narrative structure and simultaneity. So we have to look beyond the business hotels and corporate lobbies and saturated Fujifilm ads in order to map out the kinds of interiorities that Yang was really getting at and how he used space and storytelling to get us there. Big questions for a big place. This is Return to Form. Um, we've been out in the cold for a while, but as ever, Ralph and I are here to take a walk around Taipei together. It's been a long time coming, I think. Absolutely. Mm. Um, shall I just add a bit of historical context about the Taiwanese new wave that I only recently discovered and which has enlightened, Absolutely. enlightened my view of the films of Edward Yang, mm. which we are here to discuss. So... Um, Taiwan was un under martial law from 1949 to 1987. Mm. Uh, martial laws involve certain, uh, uh, certain uh, restrictions some people don't particularly like, involving no political parties yeah. <laughs> being allowed. Uh, Zelensky looking um, um. And, uh, and no, um, uh, and you know, the, the, pre the government is allowed to change whatever's said in the press and so on and so forth. Mm. This, uh, for the the former half of uh, that martial law period meant that cinema uh, was extremely constrained. I mean, it was constrained anyway uh, uh, when Taiwan was uh, ruled by the Japanese before that. Mm. Um, but uh, even afterwards, um, yeah, you have this extraordinary... Uh, Taiwanese films basically kind of have a, a propagandistic... It was formulaic. called like... So, so there's a particular phrase that was used. And it's, I think it's one of those weird... Cases where there's probably a very, it probably sounds very poetic in Chinese, but it, it, I think it's like socially healthy realism or something was like the right. dominant mode of like filmmaking before then. It was like a form of socialist realism that was like, ed, you know, edificatory and um, uh, sort of instructive and, and reflected positively on on everyday life in in Taiwan. Yeah, like yeah. A, a completely bizarre attitude towards art, obviously. Yeah. Um, and so there is a sort of a certain thaw that occurs before the relaxing of, of martial law in 1987, yeah. which allows for the Taiwanese new wave um, to, uh, whose most successful members are Hu Shashen and Edward Yang. Yeah, yeah. Um, allows them to express themselves to make work uh, from as early as 1982, I guess, 1981. Um, and... Uh, and these films, unlike a lot of new waves, which are young and fresh and reflect on the on the youth, the condition of the youth, some of which some of these films do. Um, they do, but there's a caveat. But the caveat yeah. is that 
a lot of them are looking backwards uh, and trying <laughs> to tell the stories of childhood. And Edward Yang's films are full of childhood, sometimes mm. children living in the contemporary moment, but also sometimes children living in the past. So very much retelling the childhoods of the directors. Yeah. Um, and these pasts are, yeah, the 1950s, the 1960s. When it's that period when a lot, basically, a lot of you know, Taiwan was the holdout of the Republic of China, mm -hmm. the RSC. Uh, so when Mao, Mao, you know, came to ascendance and there was a war in in the mainland China, the kind of Republican government retreated to mm -hmm. Taiwan, basically, and that's why it's a redoubt, a kind of holdout. Um, and so there's a mixture of the, the kind of context underlying that is you then have in Taiwan, you have, as it were, indigenous Taiwanese and a Taiwanese dialect. And you also have large, large, large numbers of uh, exiles from mainland China who speak, you know, the chi mainland China's Chinese dialects uh, who in a, in a way underwent their own process of assimilation, mm. um, which is something that um, both Hu Xiaoshen and Edward Yang explore in their films in different ways, but Hu Xiaoshen more so than um, Edward Yang, to be honest. But and am I right in saying that the the Western influence on Taiwan or the kind of sense of conflict that runs mm. heavily, especially <coughs> through especially um, Edward Yang's films between East and West, mm. between America and, and China, um, is partly the cause of uh, yeah, because it, caused by the, because it, in terms ambivalence. of like you know sort of uh, proxy soft diplomatic influence like america saw taiwan as like a, a redoubt of like liberal social you know liberal mm -hmm. democracy as it were so um there was a outsized american influence in the somewhat a sense of an outpost yeah in, in, in a way the, and then over the years there was a sense of abandonment because america eventually recognized the chinese mainland government mm -hmm. which kind of you know was the the coup de grace of basically of um of of the hopes of a kind of restorative mm -hmm. you know republican regime back in china it was like you know, they were, I think there was a sense of abandonment is mm -hmm. the understanding I get where the international community was like, oh no, China is the thing. Like we're just accepting this is the government yeah. and the government in exile just stops being a government in exile. It's just like, mm -hmm. this is just a, an island. Uh, the official policy is what, um, uh, one nation, two governments or something is, is there's a formulation of words. I can't remember what it is or two, mm -hmm. two nations, one government or something there's like the idea Sounds is that unsustainable unsustainable maybe yeah but <laughs> we shall see this maybe that by the time this comes out something will happen yeah, yeah. um but no um fascinating uh context and content but let's return to form <laughs> the films of edward yang have an yeah. astonishing atmosphere to them um my first exposure well my first exposure to edward yang was about uh, 15 years ago watching Yi Yi for an, about an hour and getting bored wow okay um, but let's leave that out of the picture yeah you've cha you're a changed um, man uh, I, I watched uh, The Terrorizers on 35mm at the ICA recently mm. very very commendable programming from um, from the from, from the we ICA. demand more of this from the ICA they're just, it's they're it's just bringing out their old prints and yeah. this print was absolutely gorgeous I'm afraid none of the 1080p Restos, the 2K restos really kind of hit that gold. I would mm. actually advise viewers if you're watching it on movie to just um, put your laptop on like night shift or something, like like mm. to make the make the screen a bit warmer because it really with the, with it had this real golden. Glow I, I to did it. that. I actually put my TV on a, a warmer setting. Oh, really uh, for terrorizers? Uh, terrorizers, or for pretty much every Yang film. Oh, really? All the restorations okay. were lacking a little a bit, bit green, of vibrance. A bit pale, yeah. yeah, yeah and then when vibrancy. you see them on film, they're kind of like yeah, anyway. Yeah, but um. So the Terrorizers is like a deeply modernist film, and I feel like um, just to go back to this thing about looking back or catching up, a sense that the cinema is catching up, making up for lost time, mm. um, which is an exciting thing for a cinematic movement for for lots of films to come at once. You wait ages, and they all come at once, yeah. like buses. Like buses. Um, there's a sense of a release of of of, of being able to suddenly make uh, and speak to a time to, to, to a yeah because it's a weird thing because there, there was a real sense with the Taiwan new wave that they were channeling the expressions and realities of their moment and I think yeah. it's weird because it was heralded by the government the government suddenly said we should start making films mm. about everyday life in Taiwan which led to a, a, an omnibus omnibus film mm. called In Our Time which Edward Yang contributed to yeah he's the only name amongst those five filmmakers that feels Hu oh, Shen think, but yeah didn't yeah didn't didn't contribute in a way. So Edward Young is of those five. He contributed to another omnibus uh, with his film, The Sandwich Man. The Sandwich so Man. He, which he was also later. began in this omnibus. I mean, it's, the Portmanteau film is um, 
uh, much maligned, justifiably. There are very mm. few good portmanteau films, but this yeah, was the this was the uh, incubator for these filmmakers. Yeah, because I think in you know France you get you know Paris for six and all these things. Mm. But anyway, so the, so, and this is nineteen eighty two, mm-hmm. um, and Yang makes films initially that you know if you look at those early years of in our time, uh, I've not seen that day on the beach. So no, I feel me like, So it feels like there's a missing gap. There's there. a few gaps. We haven't seen Mahjong, um, but we have seen Taipei Story, Terrorizers. You've seen Confusion, Confusion. I we've have. both we've seen, seen Yee, uh, Yee, Yee, and we've and both seen Bright Summer Day. Bright Summer Day, um, and, and so with the Terrorizers, this is a film. Of, this is really his kind of breakout film, and it's the why I mentioned Frederick Jameson in the beginning is because yeah. Frederick Jameson picks up on Terrorizers as being emblematic of, like he says, it is the postmodern film. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the quote I said about modernism being temporal, concerned with time. Mm. So he's you know postmodernism is about space, and it's about you know in a very on the nose way about space, literally about architecture and uh, urbanization and urban mm. space, but it's also about global flows of capitalism, the way that space is collapsed in, um, mm. you know, the sort of global village of Marshall McLuhan, that kind of thing. So there is a sense in which Terrorizers is about modern life, but is also a postmodern film um, in terms of its structure. And why I mentioned simultaneity is because there's a sense with as a city, characters, the way characters encounter each other, the way action is propelled, the way there are chance encounters mm. that lead to other events. Um, and it's something you see with, yeah, we see with Terrorizers, which is a uh, indebted in a lot of ways to a genre film uh, in some senses because there is a mm. kind of police procedural element to it. Um, it's police procedural meets Antonioni. It yeah, has this extraordinary yeah, yeah. Co- and I think that's like there's a lot to be learned for filmmakers in the, in the way that genre cin- the expectations of genre cinema are introduced, mm. but it's combined with like a, 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 a kind of rigorously art house. It's weird, weird saying rigorously art house, but like yeah, I know what you mean. A kind of like you know, he's not interested in in the in hitting the hitting the notes mm. of um, genre cinema, but he's interested in. But he uses all the kind of dramatic irony that you can generate mm. through. I mean, partly because a lot of his films are about uh, like gang violence. So, like in the Terrorizers, there are these sort of these uh, marauding gangs uh, rolling around, causing trouble. There's, but there's also this narrative about a doctor and his wife, who's who's this kind mm. of depressed novelist uh, who, yeah. who is totally misunderstood yeah. by her husband, completely misunderstood, and flies into these kind of artistic rages, which is uh, you know, which is actually. Uh, is a trope of Yang, you realize, because it's in Confucian Confusion. There's a character right. in that who begins to identify with Confucius. Well, of hysterical artist. Yeah, hysterical understood. artist who believes that his, his work has, the only way his work can have any resonance is if he writes kind of sappy historical uh, sentimental novels and he actually wants to write something really, really serious mm-hmm. and important. Um, but there is a, with Terrorizers, there is a... Um, this this simultaneity effect, which is kind of mm. Jameson's talking about, which is about how encounters. There's a it, it, time unfolds in the way a time unfolds in a city, which mm. is everything's happening at once, um, <coughs> and the possibility of the chance encounter is heightened, um, and that propels the narrative. It's not a conventional narrative. We jump from character to character a lot. One thing he does in Terrorizers and Taipei Story, and I think Yi mm. is he has these big yang money shots Mm -hmm. and he has it's often shot in you know sort of he does very few close-ups so we're talking kind of very wide shots which really are he does emotive wides emotive wides it really articulate the space and it might be a banqueting hall or a hotel lobby or a car park or a city street um and he pulls away and there'll be characters are framed in this kind of slightly strange angle which is often shot from up high Mm-hmm. You know, when you associate, you know, you think of someone like, I don't know, Ozu is not Taiwanese, but think about Asian cinema and you've got Ozu who was famous for his kind of hip height shot, you know, these mm. kind of low shots and that's characteristic for Yang. It's this high angle shot that mm. is really characteristic of the Yang money shot. And you get a lot of these in these films and they have this anomic alienating effect because they're often in urban spaces mm. um, and characters might appear lost or kind of adrift in this kind of urban alienating grinding sea um, I and mean, Antonio only does this loads in La Nota if you look yeah, at it like there's 100%. loads of shots which just which which are framed for the architecture and then the people move through them I mean I think that's what's like yeah that's what's important here is like the way that um, these elements of modern life like overshadow 
you know, human expression and the yeah. way, way people's emotion is sort of is relegated. Yeah, and one of the big tensions with Yang is you've got um, kind of the the detritus of the old world persisting in the new. Um, traditional bathhouses, uh, traditional foods and things like that. You know, there's mm. there's there's a modern world of arcades and TV screens. We can talk about screens with Yang because he's mm. like the uh, he's Mister Screen basically. Mm. Um, but there is you you know so at the end of uh, Taipei's story, uh, the the death that occurs mm. um, happens in a traditional bathhouse, uh, mm. which is quite pointed, I think, in a way. Like it's a choice of location, which is very uh, resonant. Of he does love to pre- end on a death. Spoiler alert. Yeah, it's quite. <laughs> yeah, he loves. To, <laughs> he lo- he's not trying to do a film that doesn't end on a death. Uh, I guess in all time doesn't, but yeah, there's like kind of yeah, but in Karen, yeah, yeah, in a sense, you know, you're right. There's a, there's a lot of blood in, um, and there's a lot of violence, uh, w- which is you know not what you're supposed because the way Edward Yang's marketed often, he's quite nice, very poetical, mm. poetical, poetic kind of, um, and he's marketed in a way that like one Wai is marketed, which is very yeah. There's a warmth and there's warm. a humor, and he works with children in a way that's mm. very like intuitive and and. Um, but when you watch it, it's knives and it's blood and it's even in his yeah. first film, uh, this this short film within in our time. You know, there's a period. There's a first period. You know, there's a mm. girls, a young girls kind of sexual awakening. You're saying blood just features in every, no matter just, how intimate. How yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. wherever it's coming from, there's blood, and I think there there is a there's a really articulate sense where yeah, urban space is. Uh, uh, alienating and clinical um, but you also get these places you know also places of social congregation and the reproduction of the mm. family unit um, the house plays a really important role you know like where people go back to and where the, the kind of domestic unit is reproduced mm. that's a really important site it's really important and there's often like a cleaving of you know there'll be a wayward son that's like a, a trope of Yang so in Bright Summer's Day the uh, our protagonist is you know he's performing badly at school his parents are you know reasonably well paid comfortable um uh bourgeoisie like they're not doing brilliantly but they're comfortable mm-hmm. and they're middle class and the son for whatever reason is just not performing well you know everything is stacked in his favor but he's just you know adrift mm-hmm. um but you get the same thing in his first film in in our in our time you've got the daughter the kind of older daughter mm. And she gets chastised by her mum at the very beginning. Like, why do you sit around all day just watching TV? Mm. Um, you know, you should go to cram school. There's a lot of, like, this idea of generational tensions. And that is something that comes through in Yi Yi as well. Because mm. that's really a story of three generations. You know, grandmother, parents, and kids. And the sim... I guess the similarity between their experiences and how they differ. Hmm. Um, but I mean, let's talk. I mean, what's the best way to approach this? We can talk linearly. We can talk maybe because I th- I suspect we're going to disagree about about which films we liked. I mean, I, yeah. I, I want to talk about atmosphere firstly, and then I want to say yeah. something a little bit something about his directing style. Let's do it. Just from what I've learned let's from from the the, the kind of um, our, our yang, our kind of uh, we've been yanging the chain exactly the last few days. Um, <laughs> something like that, I don't know. We uh, we so the atmosphere. Um, I, I was on Twitter today, and um, f- film critic filmmaker Manuel Latzik shared a clip from Antonio Antonio again. Blow up. Um, a clip from Blow Up, uh, which is the very famous scene in the park where David Hemmings is uh, photographer character is mm. kind of uh, having this casual investigation um, in this very quiet area in a park on an overcast, windy day, and you just see him kind of looking through into this uh, this sort of uh, hedge area. Um, where something may have happened and then it cuts to a shot looking upwards into the sky but there's a tree in the wind kind of blowing and you can hear the you know you can hear that beautiful sound of a tree blowing in the wind and then that that same shot kind of moves down to see him kind of getting up and and looking around um and i think manuel shared this and said oh this is like the best cut i've seen for a long time or the best cut in film you know and it's Mm. it's like that ability to like cut around like intrigue Mm. in a way that is like very very idiosyncratic very like 
it's using Hitchcock's grammar to show something that isn't quite as as straightforward. Building this thing that Yang, especially in the terrorizers, there's just so much. There is drama, there is violence, there is genre style violence, even yeah, we go yeah. as far as to say. But it's all within this very op- wide open space uh, where you're you're allowed to observe lots of elements. Of, he's not of where he's you not are. using like cutaways to draw attention to. It's almost like there's like a Bris- he's achieving Bressonian results but without Bressonian yeah. means in a way so without those Bressonian close-ups yeah, yeah. Without the, but by withdrawing from that, but at the same time he creates this atmosphere so there are moments of reflection you know Yang can be he- very very dialogue heavy but the dialogue yeah. often doesn't say much mm. what says what is speaking is what happens when characters aren't um, talking so there's yeah. re- one, of, one of my favourite shots in, in, in Yang is in Taipei Story mm. And this is a story about two lovers, uh, you know, a couple, I say lovers, they're a couple, kind of established couple, both of whom are on slightly different trajectories in life. Mm. She is an architect becoming an architect in this very um, integrated, this is lung and chin, basically. Mm-hmm. And she's very bound up with the development of Taipei. She's li- literal, mm. literally the architect of Taipei's modernization. Um, and it's for her, she experiences a lot of alienation and, and you know, she's like the engine driver of, of reproducing kind of corporate anodyne space. Mm-hmm. And then we've got the the boyfriend who is a, used to be a baseball player and is living on past glories. He mm-hmm. had an injury and he can no longer play baseball and he's now a merchant, mm-hmm. a factory owner. Um, but he's just come back from America when the film starts. He's just come back from America. And she wants to go and live in America with him and he yeah. doesn't he doesn't because he wants to but he's he wants to kind of drift when the drifting is an important part mm. this is what connects it's a global mm. um, new waves it's a sense of youthful drifting mm. um, but the 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 difference actually the funny thing is, I'll get back to what I was saying but the difference is you know with the the new waves of the 60s the drifting was linked to the student movement was linked mm-hmm. to fiery rebellion and counterculture in the 80s there is no counterculture mm-hmm. because the dominant zeitgeist the 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 kind of like inescapable reality of life in the 80s is capitalism and mm-hmm. capital and there is no alternative to that so uh some washing just fell down um and so one of my favorite scenes is when she at the end of the film is getting a new job and she's in an office space and she's with her former employer and she's walking around this yet to be office like an empty office space and the the manager is literally mapping out where the different sections of the company will be like, over mm-hmm. here will be the secretaries over here will be this department the finance department whatever. And it's like literally kind of imagining Taiwanese capital into existence mm-hmm. in this empty space and she turns and looks out the window and opposite her is this um, completely identical glass building mm-hmm. it's all very grayish and beige and her reflection is there and the way it's shot is her reflection doesn't meet her reflection her reflection is looking almost at us and she's looking out and it's a distortion effect in the glass. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you kind of see the traffic reflected on this incredible shot. And that that speaks loads. People have been talking for the whole film. And then you've got this amazing moment where she's looking into nothing. It's yeah. incredible. It's a real void shot in a lot of senses. And she's kind of aware that she's the engine of transformation and obliteration in a way. But there's nothing there. I mean, those, that leads me on yeah. really well to talk about the acting, actually, because there's loads of moments where you feel that um, that there, there's been this kind of babbling and chatter and information and context, which mm. is very important, but you sort of just absorb it, like kind of like passively, and then you ha- you're just rewarded with an extraordinary shot, usually involving three layers of depth, mm. usually involving some extraordinary reflection reflective glass or mirror yeah. kind of situation um, where a character is like allowed a moment of like of like underplayed but utterly beautiful emotion which the audience mm. is then allowed to like really like feel yeah. and, exp- and and feel more because of the the immaculately uh, the immaculately dilapidated or kind of in, in, uh, impersonal yeah, modern environment that, yeah, that, that the character's been placed in. Yeah. So uh, I was just watching an interview, one of the supplements on the Criterion edition of um, Brass or Summer Day. Love, lovely restoration. Absolutely stunning restoration. Yeah, um, really this is an interview with the protagonist, uh, the actor who plays the protagonist, Shao Sir, 
uh, called Zhang Chen, Chen Chen. And um, he was saying that actually Edward Yang w- used quite different techniques for his adult actors than what he used for his uh, for the, all the children he worked with. And he actually he uses a this is the sort of thing that people people uh, quite uh, you know find quite controversial now. But he uses a technique for a scene fairly early on in the film where Zhan Chen's character finds a a recently murdered uh, body of of someone, one of his ops, I suppose, mm. an opposing gang. But he he didn't call for it. He's you know he's, he's quite he's quite he's quite green behind the ears with this gang stuff, and he's he's deeply shocked and terrified. Apparently, Edward Yang took him aside before they did this shot yelled at him and then told him and then and then he sort of kept him in a kind of dark room for about half an hour so he basically did a kind of enhanced interrogation yeah. techniques against his uh, and then actors, like yeah. brought him out and like did the <laughs> shot and you can see the shot he looks absolutely mortified like, looks white as a sheet yeah. um really really like and he has yeah he has the fear of death in, in his eyes mm. which obviously we all remember being a being a kid and being yelled at and feeling like really but the um, world is ending exactly so so i mean he got he got the he got the job done um <laughs> fair play to him but there's fair like to them, you know that is uh it's just amusing because because it's sort of it's somewhat taboo nowadays to use like you know manipulation or whatever but mm. you know it's, it's interesting and and he um it's 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 it it, it, it delivers an extraordinary um performance and but what's what's important is that those moments, you know, that he didn't tell his actors very much context. He didn't, and and yet he was extremely precise about what they said on the script. So mm. they weren't allowed to change even a bit of punctuation in the script. They had to they had to perform exactly to the words in the script, um, and they were also not really told very much about the back. They weren't, you know, they weren't. It wasn't the sort of thing where you you, you do, you know, you spend a year being the person what you do mm. uh, you learn more backstory that doesn't make it into the film it was very much surface level but you you have to go there emotionally so he would sort of take them mm. he would get them to uh, lean into uh, somewhat method acting style thing emotional transference he'd, he'd sort of learn them how to act through this kind is of like, who shall Shen as well uh, was notorious for doing this like retakes like blows and loads yeah, of retakes, yeah 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 and retake, the actors retake, tend retake, to retake. start to feel like the yeah. characters I mean this actor said that he ended up feeling quite like after the whole shoot he sort of right, felt like he'd absorbed it, it yeah. absorbed a bit of the character into his I think there's there's something interesting because again to talk about the parallels and not the non-parallels between the time and new wave and other new waves is that children because the new wave mm. um instead of French New Wave, Italian New Wave, children are not a factor in, in, in those yeah. films at all. You families aren't really. Families aren't at all. It's about because young single it's people. It's about young single people. Whereas here, the family unit is 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 all all encompassing whether people are... I guess are, 400 Blows is about a child. But yeah, a teenager yeah. is about coming of age. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there's a sense where the family is, is like the guiding structure in people's mm. lives. It's kind of present by its absence in... Um, in 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 Taras and Taipei story, but particularly Yi in Bright Summer's Day, mm-hmm. uh, and to an extent um, Confucian Confusion. Uh, but those three films are are not really part of the Taiwan New Wave anymore because it's a little it's bit. Of, it's kind of dil- it's kind of um, I think they are by that because point, right? Bright Summer's Day is shares so much with City of Sadness. Mm, uh, yeah, 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 true, it, true, in a way, true. it's Yang's Bright Summer's Day is Yang's historical film yeah. because it's set yeah. in the 19, 1959, it's a chance to set the record straight. Yeah, and it's and for that, it's like in a way, it's in some sense it's his most conventional uh, mm. film uh, in terms of how it's shot. Um, it feels like a late career magnum opus, but it sat squarely in the middle of his his cinematic career. Mm. Whereas Yee Yee was his like last film, um, and but I he think, probably would have had a longer career had he not. Yeah, died absolutely. He died when he was fifty nine. It's very sad. Mm. Um, uh, you know, whereas Hu Xiao Shen, you know, the the I think including his short film, mm. uh, you know, Edward Yang made what eight eight films, um, whereas right. Hu Xiao Shen's made you know, thirty films or something, like twenty films. He's made loads. Um, but there is a yeah. So we were talking about atmosphere. Yeah. So we there's an amazing way Edward Yang established the atmosphere. He uses these kind of uh, these compos these these high angled deep shots with lots of depth of field to uh, 
really pincer characters in particular moments. And these are moments for reverie and reflection, often without dialogue. You know, in Yi Yi, it's uh, Yang Yang, the young kid, uh, getting bullied at the beginning by girls. Mm. And then he kind of, they, the girls walk off in one direction. He walks off alone in another direction. It's often used on the artwork and posters for this film. Um, there's a scene of the shot in, in great width of all the adults playing childlike games, uh, drinking games together. Um, and there's these great moments that kind of have a painterly compositional effect, mm -hmm. but also in that film, and you help to solidify the similarity between the adults and the young people. And there's like, you know, so they, the adults have had their playful wide. Mm -hmm. uh, Yang Yang has had his uh, somber wide. And there's a mm -hmm. wide before that that's really interesting, which is the grandmother, who plays a very little role in the film because she uh, has a heart attack about 20 minutes in and spends a whole film on a bed mm. until she dies. Um, but there's a great shot there where there's a wedding at the beginning. So uh, Yi Yi opens with a wedding. Mm. Um, and we see the grandmother sitting on her own on a low stone wall. Yeah. And above her is a tree branch, mm. a kind of gnarled, twisted tree branch. And it's perfectly aligned above her head. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's great. It's very on her nose in a way. But it's, you know, she is this kind of the root of um, the tree of, of the family unit. And mm -hmm. she's sitting alone and, and eventually does someone come up to her and ask her if she's feeling fine and she's like, oh, I don't feel so good. Um, and so he's very good at using these wide, uh, aside from all the chatter, because there's lots of business talk and there's mm -hmm. lots of jockeying and there's lots of mm -hmm. kind of Del Boy characters in his films. Like he loves, a, they, there's, you know, there's always like a businessman down on his luck who's trying to find the next big break and whatever. Yeah. That's, that's something, you know, someone's got a hustle, someone's trying to improve their yeah, lives. Yeah, you're right. Capitalism yeah. appears in in a in a more pronounced way than it probably does in European cinema. Way more as a kind yeah. of like in these in these Yang films, maybe not so much in the Hu Shen, but yeah, as a, so these this, the, the the theme of business and trying to get ahead, and especially in Yi Yi, you just yeah. get this feeling that really that people live and die by these various enterprises they're involved with. Yeah, um, it, it's know, a lived experience. It's a lived which reality. Which is true in every capitalist country, but it just feels quite like. Well, with Godard, like capitalism is a series of signifiers. It's like, no, yeah. my hammy's Hamburg, or it's like, mm. oh, Coca-Cola, Herald Tribune, Herald Tribune. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. these signifiers of global exactly. capital, whereas mm. in, we don't really see the inner workings of it. Whereas in uh, Edward Yang, we've actually, we're in the boardroom. Yeah. You know, we're, and, you know, one of the great, there's a great plot in, in Yi, which is the father who's a businessman and their company's kind of on the rocks. So they've reached out to a Japanese um, computer wizard, basically video mm. game guy, to try and bring him over to um, uh, Taiwan, and they can collaborate maybe. And the the father has these really sincere, honest conversations mm. with him. In, in the, he, they hang out in Taiwan and then they hang out in Japan. Um, and he has these like really sincere, and this Japanese guy is very really affable. Yeah, you know, he's a real charmer. He's a real charmer and very lyrical. They're both talking in English. It's quite fun. Yeah, it's really, it's quite fun. And it's, uh, and so, but we see a lot of the action takes place in boardrooms and mm. a lot of cat and yee. It's like the brother owning, owing money to everyone. And he's sometimes up on his luck and he's sometimes down his mm. luck. And it's like these, these fortunes come and go. And there's mm. something very alienating about it in a way, which is like people's destinies are so tethered to this mercurial flow of ca goods and capital, basically, which sometimes mm. are on their favor and sometimes aren't. And one thing that constantly comes up is birth charts. It's a big thing. And, you know, I guess Chinese Chinese culture about oh, like horoscopes, horoscopes, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's a big thing. And it's about fate and about mm. chance and something out of your control. And it's a great way of kind of tethering a very traditional historic belief system with a capitalist system, which yeah, things yeah. are out of your control. Like it's there's, also, yeah, yeah it's like you know, there's a there's a greater power at work here. Yeah, if it's yeah. not if it's not the gods, then it's the stock market. The stock market, right? <laughs> it's the FTSE one hundred or whatever. It's like so. I think there's he's very aware of like generational historical clash mm. um which is probably comes to head most in in some because it can't be bright summer's day because bright summer's day is set in the 60s so we don't see glitzy modern taiwan we see suburban schooly it's a town it's not Ta it's not taipei is it it's, it's outside yeah, yeah. of the city where it's a suburb or um mm. but you you loved uh bright summer day yeah bright summer yeah. day um apart from it just being fantastically restored uh mm. in this criterion collection edition um I, I did, I mean, I think my favorite young film is The Terrorizers, for, you know, for, as, as I described above, it just mm. it just has an extraordinary atmosphere. I'm, and, I, and I have like 
the most admiration for, have for how like postmodern the plotting is, how it manages yeah. to like orbit between these different characters whose lives like only are vaguely intertwine. But they interlock in key ways. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bright Summer Day is, is a bit is obviously a bit more straightforward, and it's it's uh, it's about a young boy and his family and his school life and these gangs that he's kind of in kind of imbricated in this mm. warfare that he's he's kind of stuck in the two seven one boys and the little the little park little park little boys. park gang yes park that's gang, well yeah. remembered yeah. um two seven one represent <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and you know this violence is totally senseless of course and it's it's very depressing uh and one of the characters even admits it sort of later on that Oh, you know, we we used to really be enemies, didn't we? We used to really rough each other up. That's funny, isn't it? Um, yeah. So, I think the, there's 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 also a great with with Bright Summer Day. There's a he Yang is. So we talked earlier about um, I mentioned screens mm. and the influence of American culture and global culture is is ever present in Yang films. Yeah. So there's more than one film. There are films within films in a way. So in in Bright Summer Day it is the there's a film studio next to the school they go to, and they often hang out in the um, in the in the, in the um, studio. Basically, yeah. they're often in the rafters and causing trouble and mischief and whatever, and winding the this crotchety director up, this complete like hack director, yeah. um, who presumably is like a, a a symbol of the old guard of Taiwanese yeah, cinema yeah, yeah. that Edward Yang is not. Um, and then in uh, he's not a real artist. This he's guy. not a real artist in Yi in Yi, I think it's Yi. Yi uh one of the characters uh is appears in an advert and we see her advert on tv and she's really indifferent she's mm. like, like oh your, your ad is on tv and she's like oh well, i don't care um and in um confusion confusion there's an amazing character who's a theater director uh and i guess he's like a kind of blown up version of edward yang in a way because mm. he's this enfant terrible um guy who's like completely chaotic and a complete wimp but also really aggressive and constantly trying to fuck his leading ladies um he's a very humorous character uh very cool he's constantly going around on rollerblades mm. uh but there's an amazing dialogue he's being interviewed by a journalist at the beginning and they this was yang's comedy by the way so this is so, so it was billed as a comedy film it's quite an american f- it has a quite an American feel. It's really sick comedy. You said yeah. it was like Ugly Betty. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why that <laughs> swung to mind because it's not <laughs> no. something I've been thinking about recently no, at all. No, it's not but often in your... Yeah. But there, Just, there's... Yeah, that was my reference point. He's getting interviewed at the beginning and they're like saying, oh, you used to make really serious work and now you're making a comedy. Like, yada, yada, yada. So it's, it's kind of Yang interrogating himself mm. in a way and he has this, you know, um, this figure. We get screens in his very first film in, in Our Time... Uh, the kind of layabout daughter is watching the Beatles, I think, on a kind of old early TV set. Or isn't she like listening to it on a tape? Or something? No, you see it on the TV. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, we get Elvis Presley in Bright Summer's Day constantly playing. We get all these little and, and screens are used a lot and photographs. You There's know, the baseball in Taipei Story. The baseball videos that the the guy yeah. watches. He watches old old American baseball mm-hmm. game reruns basically, and this is a he gets sent these from Japan by mm. the woman he's still kind oh, of in love with so that he's beautiful. been cheating with. So he's, there's this kind of evidence. So you screens and video and signs of glow. This is what sets a Yang film apart from a Hu Shoshen film. Maybe is screens and him shooting screens. He loves to shoot a screen. He loves an ad. He mm. loves to see a Fuji film, big, you know, in, um, Taipei story, a big Fuji film advertising neon hoarding plays a really kind of visual role in, in because he thing. has this crazy ambivalence about America. Mm. And obviously he he died he lived, he he lived, lived and in lived, he lived and died in America towards the end of his life. And um you know, there's this great anecdote in one of the documentaries I was watching about the Tainu's New Wave where Hu Shen is talking about the boys from Feng Kui. Which was, I the, think, a really early. It might yeah. be even Hu Shen's first film. It's not his first. He made a few <coughs> lesser, less well-known ones, but um, it's his breakout film. But yeah, his yeah. breakout it's film in 1983. Film. Lovely film. Very lovely film. Extraordinary color. At least if you watch the the, the restoration. Um, yeah, it looks like dog shit in the un unmastered version. Yeah, um, but yeah, really gorgeous um, film about childhood, about young boys coming of age, and it has this odd refrain of Vivaldi's mm-hmm. spring I think or yeah. summer the one that the one that's like kind of uh, anyway 
maybe it's actually just bits across Vivaldi. I, I can't, I can't, can neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> but um, my cat's just joined us on the sofa. It's very beautiful. Um, Let's forget. The, uh, and off she goes. The, so, so basically, Hu Shen says, Yes, I was I was really happy with with the uh, the film, and then I showed it to Edward Yang, and he said, "Ah, oh, such a pity." And then he recommended that I put Vivaldi, <laughs> the, Vivaldi's Four Seasons, on the soundtrack. Uh, and then Yu Shen says, "Oh, you know," and then I I absolutely loved it. I loved what he did. I mean, I think it's slightly frustrating because I don't know if these people realize quite how like these people. Well, these two <laughs> these people, directors. these two directors who are not <laughs> from <laughs> Europe, I don't know if they've had Vivaldi's Four Seasons like blasted oh, down, no, no, blasted down their ear quite Edmund as much Yang as we have. have. You know, this is the thing. So, you know, in in, I, uh, you know, particularly the the, the middle class in it, classical music plays a big role in um, Edward Yang in a lot of ways. Yeah, Western classical, Western yeah, classical yeah, yeah, music. Yeah. In Edward Yang, it does. Yeah, yeah. but that's what I mean. But Whereas Hu Shen comes from a slightly different background. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Hu Shen does like ira- amazing things with music in like Millennium Mambo, for instance. So there is like a there's a very interesting mm. use like some of that's Western music, some of that's Eastern. But like there's um, you know, like for Edward Yang to like force his mate to put like Vivaldi in is very interesting. And I don't think it does, I don't think it's a complete failure, but it is like, mm. it's just used a bit more. It's than, a bit too programmatic. It's used a bit, like I like it when it first appears and then it appears like five more times. It's like using, and it's yeah. if you drop Beethoven. Yeah. It would be, I think that the thing is though, the, the way Hu Shen and Edward Yang were interleaved, this is Gossip Corner now, were mm-hmm. interleaved. So, you know, for, in, in the Flowers of Taipei documentary, we learned you know, that Hu Shen sold his house to fund um, uh, Edward Yang's first film. Oh, wow. Um, what, the, 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 one, the one on the beach? That yeah. Day on the beach? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. And then, uh, so there was a lot of mutuality, a lot of sharing. And if I guess if a guy's sold his house, it, 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 they were very closely and they, they hadn't met until they, you know, they didn't know each other from, from way back. They, mm. they met each other through being new Taiwan filmmakers. Yeah. Um, and had a shared vision, and I mm. think the uh, they later fell out, um, uh, as really? happens. So that's that's the implication. So if you watch this, it's like God on truth. Bet- yeah, it's between the lines of um, and and I guess Romer, who was booted out by all the <laughs> young young men. Um, all new waves, just like they disintegrate because they're bitter. so overburdened with like an idea of what they are. Um, and when you in that same film, when they interview Simon Lang, you know Simon Lang came at the end of this new wave and yeah and he's almost about, like a left bank figure right yeah and he's very clear about you know i'm not really part of this like you know i'm a really different filmmaker and I, that's true but there is there, there are connections there and there's like the presence of the past and the the alienation of modernity is still there in Simon lang in a big way you know even films that are as quirky as um a wayward cloud which edward yang is a film edward yang or Hishashan could never make no uh, yeah. people dancing with giant foamy cocks and shit like that like yeah. it's never a film that um they would make but the sense of alienation the use of space mm. uh is very Taiwan new wave but i think to come back to yeah it feels like the a film like bright summer's day is really interesting to me because yeah on the surface superficially it is much more conventional historical drama mm-hmm. um but at the same time, it's shot with such a glacial oddness. Mm-hmm. And there's some amazing moments of real chiaroscuro, really dissonant. Like there's a, the, right in the middle of the film, um, there is a gang wipeout. So one gang basically kills everyone from the other gang. It's quite straight it's out quite of a intense. wuxia film. It's yeah, like yeah. really violent shit. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about that? Because I think it's, it's a real moment of, of uh, inflection in that film that's been quite slow up until that point well i already referred to it in as far as this moment that was uh, elicited this moment of of terror in the eyes of the of the protagonist that's elicited yep. through this uh dressing down that the director gave him but uh yeah it's it's a film that 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 does take you by surprise because it doesn't have an easy register mm. and because it in so, there's so many moments of of tenderness and then the tenderness through blankness and and I want to dwell briefly on the character of Ming, um, the, sort of the young girl, the young girl, the, the love interest, um, yeah. and she has a real. I mean, you can see it with both her and Chan Chen, but they 
but she particularly has this kind of blank you can really see in her eyes the feeling of someone figuring out what they think about stuff still mm. like a real like like naivety in 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 the in the like nicest sense like she's she's kind of um she's kind of on her own you first see her in like a, a, a little hospital because she's grazed her because she, from playing basketball she's grazed her knees mm. um or more than grazed actually i think it's like, really really fucked her leg yeah, up she's really fucked her leg up because this guy being like playing hardball with her rough housing yeah. um but uh yeah she becomes a love interest she becomes caught up in all this like vengeful gossipy well uh, she kind of becomes the lady with best of this 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 group in a way there's a sort of implied malevolence about you know or cold, coldness in her emotions which is interesting well that's <laughs> that's one way of yeah i wouldn't shut that off completely but yeah i sort of i saw her more sympathetically but i think that mm. she's she's not got a kind of She's not got uh, a kind of um, hostility about her at all. No, it's not hostility. It's more like it's more like the the kind of wounding that the outsized effects of when you're young that you pe- young people act cruelly to other people without realizing it because they don't yeah. know how to. They're still learning what is the right thing to do and mm. morally what's the right thing to do and ethically what the right thing to do is. And so people hurt each other. There's a lot of barely suppressed rage, you mm. know. Um, I think the the protagonist, the guy, you know, has a lot of jealousy. You know, he's kind of obsessed with this girl. He's obsessed mm-hmm. with Bing and then finally gets her and um, can't really control his jealousy in a way because she's chatting to other men and it's implied that she's had a sexual relationship with this doctor. Um, mm. <laughs> so she's uh, basically being sexually abused by a, a doctor. Mm. Um, and I don't think that's a casual thing. I think that's, he doesn't draw attention to it, but yeah. it's uh, fucked up, obviously. Um and so his he has an outsized reaction to that, which is to kill her because mm-hmm. he can't because he can't have her in the way he wants. But he, she's also, he's also jealous that she's been involved with his friend. Mm. He goes there to kill his friend, uh, also misguided, and then ends up killing her. Yeah. Um, and there's this, uh, but yeah, he he has this like really insane and and really sinister like like cold dead eyed in- he's, in- he's more of an, an Iago character if we're sticking with the, the Shakespearean yeah, yeah. Um, yeah he does because he, he says very little in the film he's often yeah. a kind of blank slate to other people's that's I think what's the, conversation. that's the bait and switch that occurs mm. if you can call it that that like he that we sympathise with him because he doesn't really give much away mm. and then he does something that like so shocking that's really shocking and really unpleasant and, and you just suddenly see uh, not just through the prism of like the justice systems that we live mm. under but like you see him like truly ruin it for himself like mm. he truly just like like he has the ch- there almost up until that point he has the chance to make good and you kind of assume having seen lots of movies about like heartwarming movies about people coming from difficult backgrounds you just assume that he'll somehow make good and mm. then he makes like extremely bad yeah because he like, ends up being this kind of like marlin brand he's like almost like a past i don't overread it but like this kind of pastiche of like a a kind of Marlon Brando of a James Dean kind of figure. Yeah. And I think that's latent there about gangs and about making a film about well, gangs. Well, because they're all imitating America. I mean, they they're are, all, right? I mean, James Dean was was um, like a reference point that I think Yang even gave to a lot of the actors. Like, they all dress up on stage when they're singing Elvis. They're sort of dressed up as James Dean, basically. Yeah, so and in a way, he's like this illusions. hollow, emotionless reproduction of him. And he's like the one that goes the hardest, in a way, because yeah. he does this completely unpremeditated thoughtless crime that makes no sense whereas mm. like at least the gang murders are based on a kind of code of vengeance and tit for tat and, tit for tat. Yeah. Um, and honor and whatever and this one is completely senseless so in a way there's even a sense so the actual leader of the gang honey is mm. this really funny character because he's like really elvis pilled yeah. it's very jailhouse rock vibes when he because he's he's talks about loads in the first and hour he used to film. date ming back he used in to the date day. ming he's he's on the run for that doesn't seem to be an issue and there's supposed to be this strange kind of like am- amicable handover between honey and uh uh he kind of welcomed charles to in and it's funny because he he's talked about for the first hour of the film in these kind of reverential tones, he's like, oh, if only Honey were here, you know, we wouldn't be having all these spats and uh, all this jockeying position. And when he finally arrives, it's so funny because he's he's got so much riz <laughs> in such a kind of a, what must be funny way because he's in this kind of Navy uniform yeah. and he's walking with his j- jacket over his shoulders and he's really like considered in how he walks, like he paces and things. And it's, yeah. I think it's supposed to be funny. Yeah, uh, he's sort of comical. He's it's kind of comically cool and it's like he's, yeah. he's seen... 
Elvis and all these magazines and there's lots of posters of Elvis up on people's mm. bedroom walls and stuff like that and I think they've he's absorbed this image of cool but he's actually a bit dim uh, but he has he's like he's talking about a book that he's read he's talking about um, he talks about war and peace but he thinks it's like a samurai novel right that's what it says oh, I read a book called war and peace and uh, it's kind of this kind of like what a dumb person does to it be smart it's like oh, i read war and peace or something. right right right, right. um well, he's, an, he's a teenager still he's, he's right? literally a kid yeah, yeah. he's literally a kid and then you know we really he's really empathetic because he mm. actually tries to um cool things down a bit he's still got rage like all these characters the, the dad's got rage you know and this, mm. he's got explosive rage um and he actually tries to patch he gets really angry at this gig because the gig is held on their turf without consulting him and he kind of is really confrontational and he actually tries mm. to smooth things over with the guy from the other gang who then pushes him under the wheels of a lorry. <laughs> um, there's a moment when there's like maybe there'll be a, re there's a rapport between these two gang leaders because, you know, oh, we're just, you know, it's just fun and games, right? And then the guy- I think just, once he kills him though, you're like, oh, he always wanted to kill him, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, well, so let's, let's, um, I mean, we could talk about Bright Summer Day for hours because it, it's a four hour film. Yeah. <laughs> but, but like, um, I think I preferred it to, I definitely preferred it to Yee Yee. You maybe preferred Yee Yee. I, I think there's a really, uh, it's, got, it's like an opening and closing flower, the narrative with, um, the narrative is very linear in, in um, Bright Summer Day. It's quite episodic. Things just happen one after yeah, another. Yeah, I don't know this, this progresses narrative. Yeah, yeah. I think there's this real opening and closing flower and there's this real interesting parallelism between the generations in Yee, which mm -hmm. I think is really interesting. Um, it's got more of the money shots, the Yangi money shots, which Bright Summer Day doesn't have. Mm -hmm. uh, Bright Summer Day is, is much more restrained uh, in its shot choice and framing and composition yeah. whereas actually it's much more like this is a Yang big money shot this I'm yeah. doing the thing that I do the wedding the wedding and the you got the wedding you got the birth the and the swimming funeral pool. right you got so this baby shower in the middle yeah so you got like slightly disordered life cycle you've got like marriage but like one wedding and a birth. funeral and a and a, and a baby shower. And between that, we've got these really nice, there's lots of elements, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's like yeah. Yang Yang, who's the young kid, who's really like uh, the tabula rasa of the adult world. Mm. And he's have he's kind of got his first kind of crush in a way. Mm. He's a very sweet little kid. And he um, takes up photography. It's It's got a lot more kind of hackneyed philosophy in it, to be honest, because the kid's like talking to the dad and he's like, oh, you can never see the back of your own head. You can never see exactly what's behind you. So you can so only see half of the stuff. truth. So he starts taking photographs of the backs of people's heads and giving mm. them the photographs. It's very nice. Um, that it's, that is Yi nice. is much more of a, a, it's a nice, it's the Joe Hisashi of, of, um, of Edward Yang films in a way. I guess like, I don't like nice films. Maybe that's mine. But it has got a really dark underbelly and it's like, I think there's something, it's much more, I suppose, philosophically on the nose. It's like, aha, this is about the generations. It's, mm. A film like Bright Summer Day is much more ambivalent and ambiguous, like morally. Um, and Yi is, I liked its neatness. I liked the opening and closing of these, these, these flowers. I liked the ambivalence of various characters. I liked that, um, I don't know, I, I, it just, it felt very neat. And it's something that I saw in Confucian Confusion as well. And as, it is a real sense of humor with Edward Yang. It's quite hot. It's easy to miss, but it's there. There's a really great thing in, in Confucian Confusion because it's about young yuppies in, in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's this director character. There's the head of a PR company. There's a young business buck who's like a millionaire who's funding it. There's all these absurd, hyst hyst hysterical, histrionic characters. Um, it's very funny and they, they fight, and, but they're all friends. Uh, and there's an amazing... Um, uh, scene where one of the characters is a civil servant and everyone's really young in this film. They're all like, they all seem like 22 or something, mm. but they're all millionaires and whatever and high flying. And he's talking to his chief, his boss in, from the civil service. And this guy's like 30, but mm. he's got a walking stick and keeps like grabbing his back. And like, oh, I'm so old and keeps reflecting on the good old days. And this is very funny that he's like, I'm going to cast like a 30 year old as like mm. an old man. Um, and I think he's, yeah, there's a sense of humor I guess, which isn't there in, in Bright Summer's Day. It's, Bright Summer's Day does really stand out from all of these films. Maybe it's maybe it's closer to Taipei's story, perhaps. It's almost like there are two two Edward Yang films. There's two like modalities of an Edward Yang film. But I, I, I felt like Yi Yi... There's definitely like a... Yeah, Yi Yi and Confucius... I have only seen, uh, you know, the first half hour of Confucius Confusion. But 
yeah, those two films, E.E. and Confusion, Confusion, feel like part of a more urbane, like mm. um, an attempt to sort of document a scene. Like, yeah, it's like a scene. Like a cont- a like it's a, a dime square. Of, <laughs> <laughs> like an attempt, yeah. like a really sincere attempt to capture like, uh, yeah, they seem quite mature films and films that like really want to, well, Yi Yi definitely really wants to get to the core. Like, it wants to mm. encompass like life and these d- different stages of life. And, and it's a very mournful film. I think it's. It, I mean, it basically has two different like uh, ex dif- like difficult ex girlfriend scenarios. Mm. Characters are reflecting upon women that they decided long to ago abandon to for... abandon for someone else, and now yeah. they're like kind of coming back to them, and, and they're not really. Well, that sure. is interesting, actually, because the. What what is the import of that? Because like, it's it's men who make a in in Yi in particular. It's well, actually all the films. There is a jockeying and a transference of love interest, and in mm. Yi, it's very pointed because two of the characters. Yeah, the guy that gets married ditches the woman he probably really loves and marries like a younger, hotter woman, basically. Mm. And in the dad in that film uh, was in love with a woman and just walked away. Yeah, and then reconnects with her in Japan. Yeah. Um, what what was the significance of that? Do you feel like these these kind of abandonments? Was it just what what did that signify? Because they felt different. These two. Yeah, I mean they. I mean, as far as the film went, they only <laughs> really served this function of uh, issuing the audience with like a sense of a sense of pain and regret. Um, it's always frustrating mm. watching characters like not follow their. It's this not, r- romeric. Not follow their, Eric their hearts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Their hearts content. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I suppose it, 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 at its worst moments, it reminded me of this Celine Song film, Past Lives, that we saw at Berlin Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> I know that's yeah. quite a harsh thing to say because that was a very, very bad film. But, mm. um, but that film basically is about a, a road not taken, a a romantic what if Uh, what if i'd stayed with this person or what if i was available to reconnect with this person um and as the audience you're meant to kind of fill in the gaps with your own pain and and like sense of regret it's a surface to project and then and then you're supposed to reject but yeah but like it's too specific it's it's not that it's too specific it's just like it doesn't actually in in all three cases, as in mm. the two relationships in Yi Yi and the relationship in Past Lives, you're not given like, you're not really shown why this person is better or more interesting or like mm. you're not given enough. You're just expected to believe that um, uh, that this is like really important, and then you're taken down the garden path of like wanting it to happen, and then. It yeah, you invest, happen. and it's it's actually he doesn't lean enough into the ambivalence of those characters. You know the like, I would we rather, don't learn enough would, about the yeah. dad in in Yi to understand why he walks away, nor why he's n- not willing to reconnect to this woman. We yeah. don't get enough. Of, um, I would rather a film. Ingredients there. I would rather a film dwell a bit more in less in this in this kind of sense of an ultimate truth that someone made the wrong call, and more in the sense of like you know, you can never actually run away from yourself and people always, like, you know, if he'd been with girl A the whole time, maybe he would yearn for girl B the whole time. You know what I mean? Like that. It's the wrong It's the wrong conundrum to be focusing on. Yeah. In and a way. It's, it's drawing attention to the, the wrong thing. The wrong thing isn't, is this couple more compatible? The question is a bit more zoomed out, which is why is this character got a sense of deep sense of dissatisfaction uncertainty in their life and that's the more interesting question which helps maybe. us get places right it yeah. helps us get to japan it helps us get um you know in the in the relation you know, it, it creates lots of lots of new arcs which is cool but i just felt that i just felt that Yi Yi is was a it was just a bit middle-aged as a film I don't it's, know. Okay. maybe i'll maybe i'll get maybe i'll get to no, 45 and i'll relate to it loads and i'll i'll eat my words but it just seemed a bit like stuck in this sense of like regret as a mode that didn't really yeah sit well i, I feel like narratively it was i really liked it's it's kind of interlacing narrative mm. like really a, it was very clever but yeah you're right there was a bit programmatic with the kind of path it led us down how it got there bright summer days are much more nuanced and, a and bit even the depiction of the kids film. was quite was more infantilizing it was more seeing them as like 
cute little kids who do funny things. Whereas mm. Bright Summer Day, kids like funny things. Yeah, exactly. Whereas <laughs> a Bright Summer Day, like the kids, like the guy, the little boy. Who, do, who sings the songs in the high pitched voice? It's way more interesting. He's like character. way more dynamic and interesting than the guy in uh, the little boy in Taipei in Ye Ye who yeah, like, no, you like are keeps right. trying think... to drown himself for no reason. You know, like in Bright Summer Day, like all these, maybe because of the whole gang warfare thing, all these kids are having to like smarten up and like and take decisions and you're with them on that journey completely. Like you're on that, you, mm. you understand. We only see the world through the kid's eyes. I think exactly. yeah, the, the, the risk with a film like Ye is, is it strength in a way, which is, is interleaving narratives to yeah. generations, but by trying to show the adult, the, the grandparental and also the child perspective, we kind of, well, they're all kind of muddied in a way. I don't know. Whereas I think, yeah, when you've got, when you're focused on a singular experience, so the yuppies of confusion, confusion, it mm. works really well because we only see the world yeah. through their histrionic. It's like, um, it's for, it, you know it's almost like Seinfeld on speed in a way uh, confusion confusion because it's it's the, the conversations are the same it's about dating and it's about yeah. money and it's about observational humor and all these things there's a lot of slapstick in confusion confusion as well as a great fight scene in a TV studio when they're still broadcasting um, between an artist and the the guy that's ostensibly kind of patronizing him um, it's great it's very very funny um, but and it's a funny journey to go on from terrorizers where you don't really know a lot like you're you're m very much in the dark about a lot of people's motivations yeah terrorizers is terrorizers. really that's why i think jameson talks about terrorizers being this kind of tip it's like the uh, postmodern film because we don't know anything about these people it is just about space and interlinkages between people and uh tr how certain kind of tropes are reproduced and upended because it is fundamental, ostensibly a crime, um, police procedural in some ways, um, and it, it, overloaded with massive moments of emotional significance yeah. and impact. You know, like the photog the young photographer um, producing this massive blown up. It's the image that is often reproduced when it comes to terrorizers and Edward Yang, which is mm. this this composite collage of a girl's face he photographs from the crime scene. She's one of yeah. the I guess uh, one of the kind of associates of the criminals mm. takes her photograph and then prints out prints it out on loads of A4 sheets of paper and it pastes it on his wall in his apartment. Yeah. And then that same apartment becomes a site of tension when his girlfriend comes in and rips all of his negatives up and mm. is developing fluid and throws it all on the floor. And he just watches her actually entranced. Mm. You know, he's the creative heart of this guy's life his studio she's actually wrecking the place and he's just looking at her with this kind of dazed uh bizarre loving infatuation and there's really great moments of that i mean that's why terrorizes is so good and it's why jameson kind of the jameson's like framing of the postmodern film really only works with terrorizers it doesn't yeah. really apply to any of uh Edward no. other films it applies Nothing a little bit to the... taipei story yeah um but that, that's i mean taipei story is it, <coughs> It would be good to talk a little bit more about that one because it's like, I mean, that's a it's a breakup film. It's it's uh, Taipei story actually has it's two people tugging away from each other, being pulled by Excuse forces me? that they are yeah <laughs> tugging away, that they are unable to really um, halt in a way. They're both kind of like in 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 their furrows. I just want to say that the um, the the actual Chinese title, Qing Mei Zhu Ma. I'm sure that's not how you say it is a Chinese idiom, green plums and a bamboo horse, which alludes to an 8th century poem by Li, Li Bai, Bai, and it used to be, uh, it's used to refer to a childhood sweetheart. So the title itself is just the substance of a metaphor that refers to a childhood sweetheart. Mm. And obviously that, that's obviously why the English title is just a different, it's just Taipei story, just a, it's an allusion to Ozu and it's using the location. But I really think we should call this film Green Plums and a Bamboo Horse. <laughs> Because it's just such a nice title. Mm. I think yeah, it's more evocative of a particular but that's by the context, by. and it's like uh, it's by the Levi. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Taipei Taipei story has this. These people are, as it were, kind of reeds in the river that are just being washed down, and mm. they are both locked into their own 
kind of what do you mean by that they're, 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 there's not much agency for either of them there's a kind of stubbornness or pulling apart from two people so it's and a love story and he's in business with her dad and, and yeah. he's getting sort of swindled by her dad there's this crazy argument where mm. she's like yelling at him for trusting her father it's like yeah. there is some quite yeah quite he's this kind of boozy and it is, there's also an amazing thing sense where he keeps returning to the baseball pitch to watch yeah. the younger um, kind of because he kind of trains him a bit and kind of he's still friends with the coach and he kind of is there as like you know the the almost star the mm. guy that was really good but had an injury and um and there's a sense of real sense of longing for an, an innocent game in a way where you could control factors uh whereas his life as a kind of textile manufacturer whatever he does factory boss isn't really his first choice and we get a sense from the woman as well that the decision she's making to pursue business and architecture is not her first choice either people mm. just in a, a kind of it's almost fate and there's uh, some really good scenes where people reflect on it you know her there's this uh, amazing scene where they're walking through this incredibly um very 1980s building with lots of plants and concrete and mm. glass and the the uh, this is when she's working at the architecture firm and the the boss of the architecture firm kind of looks out the window and he's like i find he's like the city confuses me um i look out and i can't remember which buildings i designed and which ones I didn't um, he said it seems to be growing out of my control um, and that's the kind of I'm thing I'm sure there are architects of various new, <laughs> new build developments in Hackney <laughs> like, I don't know who, who I'm sure <laughs> feel the same looking yeah, around shout out the bagel factory yeah. school. <laughs> but I think there's like there's a sense of yeah people being powerless to to change the course of their yeah. lives and it has a lot to do with fate and characters talk about fate in Taipei's story quite a lot it comes up um and that is quite compelling as like a, a critique of modernity in a way, which is like to have all of the 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 empowerment of money and stability and and sexual liberation, but actually to to be completely powerless to arrest to to kind of direct the course of your life, and that's the great kind of um, the great pathos of film like Taipei Story. Um, and, and which makes it one of his most emotion, emotionally resonant films, I think. It's more yeah. emotional than um, Terrorizers, which is quite a... It's a very Antonioni-esque film in a way. Yeah, it's, is, a, it's not really a space for emotion. It's, it's emotionlessness is the interesting thing. Terrorizers is a bit of an outlier in that it doesn't cling so much to the family as some sort of like refuge from the... Yeah, it's cool, just young people. Cool modernity. I mean, there yeah. are like... There's a husband and wife in the film but yeah I think like ty I mean, obviously Taipei story green green eggs and ham <laughs> green plums <laughs> and a bamboo horse uh, is uh, has a kind of um, you know the, their child the, their childhood romance is seen as a kind of um, as a sort of safety that mm. they that they eventually kind of like pluck his, up the courage to break away from yeah like his baseball or whatever yeah it's just this vestige of the old world and I think there's that's, a sense of protecting yourself from the from the the brutality of modern capitalism um which uh not that it's like in any way kind of a, a i forget he had a, there's this whole narrative in that which i forgot about about him helping his his layabout useless friend who's oh yeah <laughs> who lives this really like destitute life he's a taxi driver yeah he's cabby like, yeah cabby and he's like struggling and he's got an awful wife that like beats him up and spends all his money and, and he's trying to help him basically so he's 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 you know trying to yeah, he's, he's trying very to sort of generous very and generous un, yeah. but unable to apply the 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 salve and the healing yeah. to his own life if he's able to give it to other people in effect many such it cases out. actually such it's cases, very yeah. that's, that's another thing about edward yang that we love is, is he's just characters are very well observed mm. and they have very interesting like contradictory dynamics in them uh and there's so many characters as well so you're constantly having to take on board all these different interweaving dynamic I mean that's why mm. some of the films are so long because they need to carry all these different arcs between, between all these different characters yeah. Um, but yeah you, you very much get and this even happens in the terrorizers we're talking about the terrorizers as if it's mm. kind of much a bit more distant but you know there are uh, you know the relationship between the husband who's like ratting out his colleagues in order to get ahead and then his wife who's like a depressed novelist who then kind of whose who's, who's career suddenly flourishes at the end of the film you know they they're not completely in instrumental. There's this mm. you do you do get very drawn in. The same with the photographer, you know. But you get drawn in, and then you face this void, you know, where mm. you just see someone's qu quivering face and in, in response when you, to you've something. Got a character who is a photographer in, in you know in terrorizers. So someone whose job is to document. Mm. Um, 
Well, they, they're natural, at least for us as filmmakers, that, you know, that the photographer will be the natural uh, point of sympathy in the point film. Of sympathy, absolutely, not the husbands, not the wives. No. But I think there's like something quite compelling about, you know, the character who's there to observe. And again, it's there's a passivity about that because the photographer observes but can't act. Mm. Um, and it's like there's lots of, yeah, again, many such cases of characters in all of his films who are passive to change and arrest mm. the course of what is happening around them. Even though they're giving so many opportunities, like, you know, even... If you look at uh, 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 Bright Summer's Day, like our character who, who who does the great bad thing, the no-no, which is the murder of his girlfriend, um, he's given loads of opportunities and support by his family, by his friends who are very understanding. Like none of them mm. seem to be going through the shit he's going through. It's funny, you know, they've got their music and they're involved in the gang stuff, but it doesn't really affect them that much. Yeah, he's they're, genuinely kind they're of They're kind of just caught up in, in a good mood most of the time and they're yeah. just kind of trying to hang out. But he's like got this bug in him he's got this he's got this this wolf in him basically uh, and nothing can uh, change that even though he's given so many kindnesses by the people around him um and it's such a nice little troop mm. um you know it, there are plenty of films about gangs uh that make that life really off-putting mm. but it actually is a very it's like i i want to be their mate I want to be in <laughs> night school. I want to be cramming in night school and then go and beat up some boys with some w broken up chair and then wow. sing Smell of Espresso. Still you know? There's still <laughs> the night is young. Uh, <laughs> next L at the London Film Festival, we'll, uh, who are we hitting with a baseball bat? Yeah, should we do a bit of housekeeping? I, uh, How long have we been talking for? We've been talking for an hour and 12 minutes. So I, I feel I like that's, that's healthy. Ample, ample is there anything Yang more you want to say about uh, Yang? No, not really. Um, I just recommend people start with the Terrorizers. I think because that was the that was the film that really broke him open for me because I had mm. a full start with Yi a long time ago when I was getting into other yeah, Taiwanese Yi films. Yi is the wrong. It, it, Yi is basically a Hu Shashen film which has been yeah. transplanted into the hands of um, of uh, of Edward Yang. I, a, a, a Hu Shashen film. You think? It feels like a Hu Shashen film. I don't know. It feels very Hu Shashen coded. Uh, apart from its its interleaved narrative structure, which is not very Hushan, who's a I very linear I think it's very filmmaker. Yang, but it's very the fact that he's been in America. It's very like it very much carries that ambivalence about different different like ways of filmmaking, and that's mm. I suppose it's about show don't tell, right? I mm. think that like in other films, that ambivalence between East and West is shown in a really beautiful way, even if it's like people just like singing American songs in a funny accent. Like there's a lot of that stuff that that is like really moving as you can see this cut, you know, there's like a literally a diner with like, like Taiwanese flags and, and star spangled <laughs> or banners. Or NBA playing in Confucian Confucian. Yeah. There's a bar they go or to. Or the where baseball being played in, in, in the green, the green. I think, I think there's something uh, about, the, yeah, the, 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 that's the other factor of Jameson's post-modernity, which is the kind of more superficial form of post-modernity, which is about global, the global village mm. and this kind of global, global system. Um, but whereas I feel there's always in America, there's always a cousin yeah. in America or a brother in America, and mm. it's a, a great thing about misconnections in in Taipei story where he's constantly trying to get hold of his brother on the phone because mm. uh, of the time difference, yeah. he can't quite contact. So there's a desire to connect globally. And there's all these shots of telephones as well. Yeah, those are shots in telephones in terrorize as well. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a lot. I think that the problem with Yi for me is that it verges into a style of American filmmaking that. I don't find very interesting or at least the side of it that I don't very, find very I interesting. I suppose it looks like a pastiche of what uh, Asian cinema might be. I think it looks like a pastiche of like the high school reunion film. It just has this strange like, you know, at its worst moments, it also has loads of beautifully Yangian moments where people are just like gazing into windows onto motorways with it all reflected. Like it has loads of like... It's got the money shots. Beautiful, yeah, yeah beautifully like eight anime set pieces that, that we, we love him for. And, it, you know, you can't have a film that's just that. It needs to be counterbalanced with something, but the thing it was counterbalanced with it in the case of Yi, I was just like a little bit bored by it, to be honest. Mm. Um, it feels longer than Bright Summer's Day. Yes, that's even what's funny. Being shorter yeah, <laughs> the three-hour no. film feels longer than the four-hour film. That's mm. my review of Yi and, and then Bright Summer Day. Mm. Um, but love, love Bright Summer Day and Terrorizers. Those are definitely like I love Taipei like, Story. I'm so Taipei Story. Um, that's Bell, true. That's also a very good one. Uh, which came before Terrorizers, actually. Yes, it's, 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 it's his third, third film. Third film. Um, all right. Uh, should we talk about housekeeping? A little bit of, of housekeeping. Um, we are both going to be reporting from the London Film, the BFI London Film Festival, yeah, uh, which will give us a chance to catch up on uh, mostly on things that were at Cannes because obviously we've seen all the Berlin shit. I'm so excited because we've heard 
great things about some films we haven't seen yet yes um mm. this is it's quite good yeah because yeah. with berlin we didn't really know quite what what to pick uh always we we did we ended up just seeing lots of stuff mm. uh with london we can be a bit more picky because we've had a few recommendations from we've friend, sent friend we've of the sent pod, the, uh, the pathfinder battalion into have have gone over the top yeah. already and they've been gunned down we've, had, we've got we've got friends friends in clicano friends in can we've mm. we've we've assessed the lay of the land and we're going to pick, choose wisely yeah and we're going to see only good films um we're hearing great which things be, about uh although we're hearing great things about eureka we're hearing moderately great things about the new Jay Lan. We're hearing, hearing great things about uh, Radu Jude's um, latest. Yes, well, we, yeah, we've seen we've that seen and that we so really well, loved sure. it. We loved it. Um, <laughs> we'll be doing a Radu Jude. So that brings us on to the next point, which is that we will be doing a Radu Judo Podo. We're going to go into the Judo Radu Dojo. Jude yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, a Jude cast. The yep. adjudication of these films. Yes. Um, it's the perfect time to, to, to kind of cover him more, more, more widely. Uh, we will be doing that with the, uh, the help of the ever perspicacious George, <laughs> George Macbeth, um, uh, which is great. And then we are also probably going to tackle Petzold in a, in we a, need in a more to serious Christian way. Christian Petzold. Because yeah. uh, I have feelings and thoughts about Christian Petzold, as we all know, is like a, a filmmaker who... It basically is a, is a coin flip. So one one half of his films are extraordinary, and the other half are complete dog shit. Um, and people tend to disagree about which side which side of the coin <laughs> is. Well, it's obvious, uh, um, but, but yes, that, um, we will we will uh, we will attack those uh, those treasures. Um, and you will finally see a fire which uh, you were in the screening room for until you realised you'd lost your passport. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you're oh, yeah, you're bringing up law, ancient law, ancient but I'm not going to like return to form law. like Chin and Lung in in Thai story. I'm not going to live in the the glowing aura of the past. I'm going to focus only on the future. Yes, and um, the future's bright. Um, so LFF that will be in October. Radu Jude beforehand and and probably Petzl because I think Petzl the new Petzl's coming out quite soon. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've seen five minutes of it. We uh, yeah. So <laughs> uh, we recommend passages by Iris Sachs. Well, you actually haven't seen that one. But I'm seeing it uh, next week. Very good, very good. Uh, um, so, so maybe maybe listeners will be interested. So next week uh, I'm doing free promo for for I'm doing promo for the film to be honest. But it's screening at Rio Cinema and it's also screening at the BFI. Tight. Iris Sachs will be it present for I think both of those screenings to Amazing. do a Q and I've heard he's a very good figure and he's very articulate on his own films and it's worth seeing. It's one of those uh, director Q and As are very very much worth it. Um, so it's screening next week. I'm going to be getting my tickets. I'll probably see you at the Rio because it's a little bit closer. Yes, for me. Um, jolly good. So, and and we have been. We have must admit we've been on, been on a summer break. Uh, many of our fans will be disappointed at such a long hiatus. It can only be explained by the fact that we've been making films and on holiday. Uh, for, we need to rest for about six weeks. Uh, but we uh, have uh, mid-August. Uh, we are already, we are already when back on the horse. When months get a bit colder, I think, and yeah, yeah. you know, the summer, like we, you Although know, it hasn't been a particularly warm. No, it hasn't summer. been to be, but Ralph and I and our group of friends, you know, we like to be outside. We like yeah, to yeah. to sit on the roof. We, you know, so I think w- w- when the months draw in, nights draw in, we will be watching a disgusting amount of films. Buku de Kino, yeah, Buku de Kino, and we will be talking about them uh, and infinitum. So yeah, stay tuned for all of that, come. and you will obviously, as listeners be indoors a lot more as well because of how cold it is and you'll yeah. be listening to us because you have <laughs> maybe you're falling asleep to us right now yes um, who knows um, on that note uh, we're so back we're so back